Thank you for joining me on this Easter weekend. Um, I didn't plan to do a live today, but um, in the week, such an important uh, discussion came up um, with Dr. Renenbaum that I thought that I had to capture these thoughts and put them out. And essentially, he has been working on an open letter, which we're going to be talking about in a little bit more detail. Before I start that, though, I just wanted to remind you that it's a good opportunity for you to think about joining me on Substack. I have been managing a Substack page now for a number of months. It's growing very nicely, and I'd like to encourage everybody, if they want to see over 230 posts, videos, and podcasts, just to click on the link, which will be shown soon, uh, philipmacmillan.substack.com and this is where we'll be sharing some of the concepts with regards to COVID-19. So before we go any further I'll just get uh, straight into our presentation and I'm sure you will find it very very interesting. But we've got the pleasure of speaking with, with Rob today and he has done an incredible piece of work that he thinks is important enough that he steps aside from some of those uh, ideas about speaking on a public forum, and he's willing to share his thoughts and his ideas. And we're just going to be talking generally. Hi, Rob, how are you? Really, Hi, really. And, and I just wanted to say, Rob, and I'm positioning this for people to make it clear that there are some people who have a passion or a desire to do something. And when they do, they will step outside of their comfort zone in order to try and make the points. So before we go into anything, Rob, I just want you to do a quick one and, one and a half minute introduction about who you are and what your background is. Well, you're right, Philip, this is out of my comfort zone. So I appreciate your sensitivity to that. Uh, I'm a pediatrician and a pediatric rheumatologist, and for viewers that may not know, rheumatologists are physicians uh, who study and treat autoimmune diseases like rheumatoid arthritis and lupus, and in kids, uh, chronic uh, or juvenile chronic arthritis, we used to call it juvenile rheumatoid arthritis, and there are a number of other rheumatic diseases of adults and children. Uh, rheumatologists also study and treat auto-inflammatory uh, and, uh, I'm sorry, hyper-immune and hyper-inflammatory disorders such as cytokine storm. And that's relevant, very relevant to COVID because severe COVID is characterized by hyper-inflammatory, hyper-immune reactions, including cytokine storm. Uh, I'm uh, largely retired at this point. Uh, about four years ago, I officially retired from the pediatric rheumatology department at the Cleveland Clinic. Before that, I was at Alberta Children's Hospital in uh, Calgary, Canada, where I was clinical professor of, of pediatrics and pediatric rheumatology. And before that, I was at Nationwide Children's Hospital at Ohio State University in Columbus, Ohio, where I was associate professor of pediatrics and chief of pediatric rheumatology for about 20 years. And before that, I was a pediatric rheumatologist at Cincinnati Children's Hospital. Wow, tremendous. And I tell you what, I want you to just tell us a little bit about your focus in that time. Is it Susak syndrome? I, I personally know very little about it. What What is that and why did you focus on that in terms of your career? Well, for the last 17 years, really, I have focused uh, particularly on Susak syndrome. And when I was at the Cleveland Clinic, I was the director of an international uh, consultation clinic for Susak syndrome. It's a very rare autoimmune disease. It's an immune mediated ischemia producing occlusive microvasculopathy uh, that affects the brain and the retina and the inner ear causing many strokes in those organs. 
So it's, it can be, uh, and often is, a very devastating autoimmune disease. Uh, <clears throat> and it too is relevant to COVID because I think there are aspects uh, of the immunopathogenesis of COVID that also involve an immune-mediated ischemia-producing occlusive microvascular endotheliopathy in the lungs, for example, and in other organs. And even in some of our concerns about adverse effects of the COVID vaccines, uh, <clears throat> the immunopathogenesis of some of those adverse reactions may involve uh, a microvascular endotheliopathy. So it just so happens that the uh, interest I've had in SUSAC syndrome for the last 17 years has turned out to be relevant uh, to COVID, just as the experience that pediatric rheumatologists have had with cytokine storm and hyperinflammatory hyperimmune reactions has been very relevant to COVID. <clears throat> because as you know, Philip, uh, COVID is a two-phase illness. Mm -hmm. There's an initial acute viral phase that lasts approximately a week. And then after that, in some patients, there is a hyperimmune, hyperinflammatory reaction that can include a cytokine storm that goes on, that occurs in the second and third weeks and can go on longer than that. And it's the, the patients who are in the ICUs and the patients who are dying of COVID are in trouble because of that hyperimmune, hyperinflammatory reaction. And mm -hmm. so pediatric rheumatologists experience with cytokine storm uh, has been very relevant to what's going on with COVID. I'm, I'm, still... glad you, I'm glad you mentioned that, Rob, because I've been arguing now for two years that COVID-19 is a viral mediated autoimmune disease. And this is I one agree. of the reasons why I've been so fascinated to talk to you as a rheumatologist, because everything I have looked at is that this looks like a rheumatological disease. This, this should be managed by rheumatologists. Well, and I would add that pediatric rheumatologists experience with systemic onset juvenile chronic arthritis has been particularly helpful because those children have a very explosive cytokine storm, even much more explosive than occurs with COVID. And so for several years, uh, pediatric rheumatologists have been collaboratively studying uh, cytokine storm in that context. And we've done uh, observational studies as well as randomized controlled trials to figure out how to best protect those children. And for several years, we've established that the way to help those children is to, first of all, be very quick to recognize that they are going into a cytokine storm situation, pick it up early before it gets out of control, because it's much more difficult to control once it's gotten out of hand. So early recognition and then very prompt and appropriately aggressive immunosuppressive treatment of what's going on. Uh, with, at the very least, appropriately high doses, and it often takes uh, quite high doses of corticosteroid. And uh, we've also found that it, it's uh, very often necessary and can be extremely helpful to use anti-cytokine therapies. And I'm talking about anakinra or toxilizumab. And I particularly like anakinra because it works very rapidly and, and might even be more effective than the toxilizumab. But these anti-cytokine therapies we've been using for several years. Oh, can I can I pause you on that, Rob? So we're digressing a little bit, but this is just so important that I, I'm, I'm going to dig a little bit further in this. I want to ask you a question. As I have been saying that this is an autoimmune disease and what we actually need is more immune suppression. Yes. Can you explain to me what would have been going on in the minds of the researchers when they first found that dexamethasone was effective or more effective than doing nothing? Why would they not have gone on to check the dosing? 
to see if even higher doses work. And that to me is like one of the most obvious questions. Well, and it's good that you brought that up, Philip, because one of the first reasons I got involved in writing about COVID is one of the first things I noticed was, my gosh, they're not, they're not treating these severely ill patients with the kind of immunosuppression that we were accustomed to using uh, in pediatric rheumatology. And, and I had the same question you, you did, what, why? And in fact, there was even uh, official discouragement of using corticosteroid and very little mention of using anti-cytokine therapy. Uh, so it was actually discouraged initially. Um, but I think there was an, I think the reason for that, one reason for that is COVID is initially a viral disease. And I think a knee-jerk reaction usually, if you're dealing with a viral infection, the last thing you want to do is give immunosuppression because it might suppress the, the normal immune response uh, that we need to eradicate the virus. So I think part of the problem was that uh, the doctors in the ICU, for example, were afraid to use corticosteroid out of fear that it might make the viral phase worse. But I think what they were slow to realize is that by the time the patients were in their second and third weeks and were ending up in the ICU, the acute viral phase was already over or largely over. And the main reason they were so ill was the hyperinflammatory, hyperimmune cytokine storm reaction. And what they needed was immunosuppression uh, and bold immunosuppression. And that's a scary thing to do uh, in, in, the, in the wake of a viral infection. So I think that was the main reason doctors were hesitant to be as aggressive as they needed to be. And I think that was also the reason uh, corticosteroid therapy was initially kind of discouraged. So, so here's a question based on your experience with the pediatric patients where you said that they have even a more severe cytokine storm in some of these diseases. If you pull back and just imagine that you were allowed to use the tools that you had and you saw patients coming into hospital with what you thought was the immune phase of the disease, when you think about the impact of the immune suppression on those younger pediatric patients, how many people would you think that you could have saved with really aggressive immune suppression? I think a lot. Uh, and and the, the key, I think, is early recognition and documentation that a patient is heading into a hyperimmune phase. Uh, so what I would r recommend, for example, is uh, you can monitor patients as they're going through their COVID illness. And if they're on day seven or eight, and it's noticed that they were starting to get better, but now they're getting worse, uh, there are several laboratory tests that that you can do to document whether it's true that they're uh, heading into a hyperimmune phase, a serum ferritin level, CRP, even a simple CBC. Uh, so there are laboratory tests that can that doctors can use to document whether patients are heading into this phase, and 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 you could also do a. Uh, a a COVID PCR test and look at the CT value, by the way, which would tell you what the, or give you an idea of what the viral load is at that point. If the COVID test is still positive at that point in time, but at a CT value of 45, that probably means that the virus load is already very, very low. And in fact, there may not be any live virus left at all. The test may be picking up just some fragments of dead virus at that point. Uh, wait, but before you go any further with this, this is an area that you point out in the open letter. Can you just explain to 
the general population. When you talk about CT values and the the use of the PCR and so on, what are you talking about? What well, it simplify it? Yeah, and I think this is really important. So I'm glad you asked. Uh, the CT value stands for the cycle threshold value or the cycle threshold number. And it refers to the, the number of amplification cycles that the PCR machine needs to go through, how many times it needs to amplify the uh, possible viral material that's in the patient specimen before it can detect presence of viral material. So if the PCR machine only needs to amplify uh, the material in the specimen 18 times, that means there's a lot of virus in that specimen and that patient is very infectious. If, it, if the machine needs to amplify the material 40 times or 45 times in order to detect presence of possible viral material in the specimen. That means there is hardly any viral material present at all in that particular specimen. And in fact, it's such a tiny amount that the machine can't even be sure that it's SARS-CoV-2 fragments that it's picking up. All it could say is, well, there's maybe something there, but it's inadequately determinable whether it's truly SARS-CoV-2. If it, which means it could well be a false positive. And even if it's a true positive, if it requires 40 or 45 cycles of amplification to detect it, that means it's probably dead fragments and the patient is not infectious. So, so you, you said something there that I want to capture with that CT values. You said something there that I think is really interesting is that what you are saying is when the patient deteriorates, you do two things. You look for evidence of the cytokine mm -hmm. storm mm -hmm. and you measure the viral load to determine if that patient would probably need antivirals along with the immune suppression? Is that what you're saying? Right. It's an indirect measure of viral load, and it's not a perfect measure of, vir of a viral load, but it is far better than nothing. So mm -hmm. instead of just doing a COVID PCR test and having the result come back positive or negative, which doesn't tell you how strongly positive it is, if it's positive, you would want to get look at the CT value at which it's positive. If it's still, of course, if it's negative at that point, then that would suggest that the acute viral phase is all over so that you don't have to worry so much about giving immunosuppression at that point in time. But even if it's positive, if it's positive at a CT value of 40 or even 35, and certainly if it's only positive at a CT value of 45, then that means that you don't have to be so worried about giving immunosuppression at that point because the patient has already passed through the acute viral phase. Their immune system has already taken care of the virus. But the, and the problem now is that their immune system has gone overboard, which fortunately doesn't happen very often, but that's why people end up in the ICU. So the CT value of the COVID PCR test on day eight, for example, uh, can be very helpful in reassuring the physician that uh, number one, it's, it, it is probably true that they're heading into a hyperimmune phase. And number two, it's probably okay to give the immunosuppression that they need, which shouldn't be a surprise to the physician because we know that usually that acute viral phase is largely gone or at least markedly subsided by day the eight. Time. So the message is that if you've got an extremely ill patient in the ICU or in the hospital who's during the second uh, and certainly the third week of their illness, they are probably suffering from a hyperimmune, hyperinflammatory reaction. They probably no longer have uh, active viral infection going on. That is not the problem. The prop, what 
what they need is aggressive, appropriately aggressive immunosuppression, and you need to be bold enough to do that. That's the lesson we learned in pediatric rheumatology. I, I, I think it's applicable. I wanted to ask you a question on this because this is something that I think, again, is critical. So I'm going to use the example of, of bacterial sepsis. Yeah. And what we're told is or taught is the six hour period. You need to get the antibiotics in within six hours for antibiotics to be effective. If you miss that, your effectiveness starts to drop off very sharply. Do you see a similar pattern with the cytokine storms in the pediatric population? How critical is the time frame for starting the immune suppression? You mean in the bacterial setting? No, no, no. So oh. I'm using the bacterial setting as an example of yeah. where time is very critical. In terms of your pediatric patients with the cytokine storm, oh. what time frame, in order for you to be able to be effective with the immune suppression, how quickly do you need to get in? Very quickly, because it can move very fast. Now, children's immune systems, I think in general, are more explosive. They're younger, more vibrant. They have to be uh, much better able to protect the, the, the child. They're designed to be, if anything, overly protective because children are very precious. And so they have a very healthy, robust uh, immune system that is ready to explosively go into action to protect them. So ch that's why I was mentioning earlier, children who go into a hyperinflammatory, hyperimmune cytokine storm situation do so much more explosively and much more quickly, probably, than adults do. So we have learned that you don't have much time. You need to pick it up very quickly that that's what's happening. And you need to intervene promptly with an appropriate and, and usually bold, appropriately bold level of immunosuppression. And what, so, what number though? Are you talking about six hours, 12 hours, 24 hours, 72 hours? What kind of time frames did you find needed to be? Meaning, uh, it, it, because one of the problems is, is that sometimes they do use high dose immune suppression, but they're doing it day four, day five down the line, and they're saying it doesn't work. Well, once a child with systemic onset uh, uh, juvenile chronic arthritis, for example, develops a cytokine storm situation, uh, the, the sooner you, you intervene, the better. Uh, and uh, we routinely uh, check for the possibility that that's what's going on. And we can get these results back very quickly, by the way, a ferritin result comes back very quickly. And so, it, and if we don't intervene within a matter of even hours or a day or so, uh, things just get more and more out of control. And then it's harder and harder to bring things under control. And if you're too slow in bringing that under control, then that cytokine storm starts damaging or harming internal organs. And you start getting multi-organ failure. Uh, you get ARDS in the lungs, you get liver uh, failure, you get myocardial suppression, suppression, you can get CNS manifestations, you can have a total body multi-organ dysfunction situation that can be so out of control that either you can't bring it under control uh, or if you do, damage has already been done. So it is critically important to recognize cytokine storm quickly promptly and intervene quickly, promptly and appropriately aggressively. Wow, tremendous. I, I'm sorry we digressed on that because it was so important and it was great to get your, your expertise on that. So I, I take us back now to the, the open letter. Yeah, yeah. Because you've got all these years of expertise. You saw the links and you've been researching this for now almost two years. What made you decide at this point to do an open letter? Uh, well, <laughs> lots of things. Um, for one thing, I, I was concerned about parents 
being feeling under pressure to get their children vaccinated without those parents really receiving adequate uh, adequate education about the whole COVID situation and the COVID vaccination situation, and without those parents really receiving the kind of inf uh, information that they needed to do justice to the informed consent concept. Instead, it appeared to me that they were being given uh, an, an overly uh, simplistic and an overly confident and overly reassuring message that, oh, these vaccines are safe, effective, absolutely necessary, uh, definitely get vaccinated. I, I, I did not feel it was that simple. And I had a lot more concerns about the safety and the efficacy, both at the individual level and at the population level. And so to me, it was a much more complicated issue it required a much deeper appreciation of the immunology, uh, virology, vaccinology, uh, evolutionary biology uh, of the COVID situation. And I felt that parents were just not getting this information. And, I, and it was apparent to me too that uh, the pediatricians often didn't have enough of this information Wait, they, I, I just want to pause you on that because that's exactly what i was going to ask you rob i was going to say to you when you were fully involved i mean now you've stepped back so you have some more time you wouldn't have had time to do any research and you would have had to just take what you are given yeah. and in effect i think that most clinicians think well People have checked this over. They said it's safe. There's probably safe. Why would you even question? Right. I think that's exactly what has been going on, Philip. First of all, I, I don't think uh, pediatricians and physicians in general have really had a fair chance to do the extensive, deep homework that they need to do on COVID. They've been way too busy. Doctors are all doctors are chronically overextended. <clears throat> they're too busy. They don't have time. They're too tired. They don't have the energy to delve into this. And I think in many instances, uh, they were strongly encouraged, even pressured, to just simply trust and accept the prevailing narrative uh, and, and don't challenge it. And I think another problem, too, is that uh, Many physicians just don't have a very deep background in immunology, virology, and vaccinology to allow them to adequately, critically examine the prevailing narrative. Uh, so for all those reasons, uh, I felt that there was a need for maybe someone like me to do the homework for the doctors and for the parents. Um, and then share the results of that homework with them. And being retired and, and having the time and having the energy and having the immunology background that I had, uh, <clears throat> I, I was happy to, to do all of that extensive homework. And like you, like you say, for the last two years, I have spent several hours a day on most days of most weeks studying and writing about all different aspects of COVID. And I'm, I'm glad that I've had the time to do that because I think it's been important to do that. And I wanted to uh, write down a comprehensive uh, explanation of what that homework revealed and then share it with parents and doctors who were too busy uh, to understandably to do it themselves. So, so without without going into because it, for people who want to read the open letter, it, yeah. it will be. I'll have a link afterwards on 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 the presentation on my Substack, and I think you've also got it on um, Gert's website. We'll we'll talk about Gert a little bit later. Yeah. But this picture you started off with that. What what does that mean? Because you put these pictures in with a specific thought in your mind. 
Well, the, uh, the open letter begins with three photographs for, that uh, Eugene Smith did. Eugene Smith was an absolutely brilliant photojournalist back in the 1950s. And he was very concerned about uh, health issues, poverty issues, and so on. And so I opened the, the letter with three of his photographs uh, to kind of set the stage. And so what does this one mean? What, what, what are you capturing here? Well, uh, uh, the innocence of children. Uh, and I wrote a little caption for that that essentially says, you know, our uh, two of our main goals in managing the pandemic are to protect the vulnerable people, elderly people and otherwise vulnerable people, and create the best possible future for our innocent children. And so I just raised the question, uh, are we sure that we're doing the latter? Uh, yeah. Are we sure that the mass vaccination campaign of children is in the best interests of the children. Excellent. What does this picture mean? Well, this is another one of Eugene Smith's uh, photographs. And in the caption, I just uh, ask people to imagine what is, what is this boy uh, crying about? Uh, is he, has he lost his grandparents? Is he worried about to COVID? Is he worried about uh, his own parents? Um, I imagine that perhaps his mother and father are in, in healthcare, perhaps a doctor or a nurse, and maybe they've been under pressure to get vaccinated and maybe they have hesitations about it. Um, maybe he's worried about uh, vaccine side effects. Uh, maybe he's worried that he'll get COVID. Uh, the point is that children have a lot to worry about as well during this COVID uh, campaign. and. And we owe it to try to help them understand what's involved with COVID and make the best decisions regarding uh, vaccination, for example. Excellent. Uh, I'll show you the third one here. What does this one mean? Um, well, I wanted the reader to look at this doctor who, who's exhausted, who's tired, who's thinking deeply. And imagine, what is he thinking about? What is he wondering about? Is he, is he wondering whether we're doing enough to help the, the patients who develop severe COVID? Is there more we should be doing? Have we been taking care of them in the right way? Um, uh, he may be worrying about all the things that there are to worry about with the COVID, worrying about the illness itself, worrying about potential side effects of the vaccination program. Um, both on an individual level and a population level. So uh, I just wanted the reader to imagine what this doctor uh, might be thinking. So these, these photographs were designed to just draw the reader in and uh, provoke some, some thoughts. Mm. So what really, because it's a long document, what are the main areas that you were, you were covering in that? Well, and I must confess, Philip, that it's more of an open book than it is than a letter. open letter. Yes, that's right. It, it is very long. It is, it is what, six, 40 pages, 60 pages? Well, it's, it's almost 60 pages of text. And then there's 60 pages of references after the text <laughs> that contain uh, over a thousand uh, references from the medical literature, uh, the vast majority of which are peer-reviewed published uh, articles. So yes, it is a long document, but this is a big subject. It's a very yeah. complicated subject, and I wanted to cover lots of different aspects of COVID. Uh, is divided into actually 10 sections or 10 chapters. And uh, just very quickly, uh, uh, yeah, there's the table of contents. Um, uh, in the first chapter, I just explain uh, that there's two conflicting competing narratives, particularly regarding COVID vaccination. Um, <clears throat> And so I describe those two narratives. 
And then in the, uh, uh, let's see. Then you have the overview of the human yes, immune system. I thought it was very important for parents and pediatricians to understand how extraordinarily complex, but also extraordinarily beautiful and competent the human immune system is, how precious it is, and how delicate it is too. And I wanted to get the message across that we should view the human immune system as, a, as an immune ecosystem uh, in the sense that we need to protect it in the same way, appreciate it and protect it in the same way that we have learned to appreciate uh, nature's ecosystems and uh, be mindful and protective of those ecosystems. And in that, and so I wanted the readers to, to have a, a solid background ab about how the immune system works not that they needed to master that information, but I wanted to have them have at least a, a vague appreciation of how complex it is and how careful we need to be with it. And I think one of the most helpful uh, things about that discussion is I pointed out that we have a mucosal immune system and we have a systemic uh, immune system. Uh, yes, and, and that table uh, reviews and explains that there's uh, two compartments really to our immune system. And then each of those compartments has uh, an innate immune system and an adaptive immune system uh, that's present in both of those compartments. And for a respiratory virus, um, the first line of defense is the is our mucosal immunity and particularly the innate immunity system within our mucosal uh, compartment and with lots of children uh, and healthy adults the innate immunity within our mucosal immune system uh, can some can very often take care of the virus without even needing to utilize the more sophisticated adaptive uh, components of the immune system and the systemic compartment might not even need to be involved. So if our mucosal innate immunity is robust and healthy enough, it can protect us from respiratory viruses um, <clears throat> without having to resort and, and recruit uh, all the rest of the armamentarium that our uh, normal immune system has. So anyway, I wanted to give a lot of background uh, for the reader to appreciate how uh, the immune system works. Mm -hmm. And then in the next chapter, I, I talk about uh, how uh, a viral epidemic or pandemic normally plays out if there are no vaccines available for that particular uh, virus. And the emphasis there is on the development of herd immunity, how herd immunity develops and how that herd immunity ends up uh, uh, bringing about the subsidence of the, of the epidemic. Uh, and then in the next chapter, I explain what happens when you uh, manage a respiratory virus pandemic with uh, a suboptimal vaccine. I'm going to pause you on that point there, Rob, yeah. because I know that you have spent a lot of time reviewing a lot of the work from Gert van den Bosch. Yes. And you have analyzed it and you've come to the conclusion that these perspectives are very, very important. But you would accept that the majority of the scientific community across the world have not listened to his perspective. Why did you? Well, thanks to you, by the way, <laughs> you I saw in an interview that you did with Geert and, and I think you were the first person mm. that ever interviewed Geert. And um, I saw that interview. 
And number one, I was very impressed with both of you, uh, but very impressed with how credible and knowledgeable and properly motivated uh, Geert seemed to, to be. I could just tell from his character that here was a, a, a physician, or sorry, he, he's actually a veterinarian, but here is a scientist who deeply understands the immune system and deeply understands virology and vaccinology and very importantly, the, the whole concept of evolutionary biology. And I could tell that he was very concerned about uh, problems he perceived with this mass vaccination campaign. And it seemed very important to me to listen to Geert. Uh, he didn't profess to have a perfect understanding um, and, but he just wanted to have his concerns heard and debated. Um, and his initial work was a call, literally a call to bring scientists and, and physicians together, uh, to, uh, engage in healthy, constructive, scientific dialogue about these concerns that he had. He, he wasn't necessarily 100% sure that his concerns were, were going to play out over time, but at the very least, he wanted those concerns to be addressed. And, and this, is, this is something in terms of, of risk management that people don't quite seem to understand is that it's not necessarily that something is going to happen, but you look at contingencies, you say, what if, or how does this play in? Yeah. Well, why do you think the scientific community was so averse to even reflecting on the, the concerns? I don't know, Philip. Uh, it, it goes against the tradition of medicine and science to not be open to all plausible hypotheses. I mean, that that is one of the most important and precious traditions in medicine and science is to uh, be appreciative and open to a variety of possible explanations for things, a variety of hypotheses. And it surprised me that uh, particularly those who most strongly promoted the prevailing, what I call the prevailing narrative, uh, did not seem to be interested in what Geert was concerned about. And, and, and Geert tried very hard to engage uh, people who disagreed with him in, in conversations and dialogue about this. And uh, there, there just didn't seem to be much interest. I, I think it's partly a matter of being open-minded. I think part of it too is you have to have a pretty deep appreciation of how complex the immune system is in order to even imagine how uh, careful one needs to be uh, when you embark on a, 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 a mass vaccination campaign. And just to very quickly review, Geert's concern was the idea of, of uh, rolling out a rapid mass vaccination campaign using a suboptimal vaccine in the midst of an active pandemic involving a highly mutable virus, a highly infectious virus, a respiratory virus, and doing this across all age groups, he saw that as a recipe for regret. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it gets into quite a complicated explanation as to why Geert felt that way. Um, and I spend quite a bit of time trying to help people understand what Geert is concerned about. But you do, you do accept that many people 
don't agree with with that. Well, I mean, I, I, yes. What I don't accept, though, is a a uh, refusal to engage in constructive dialogue about it. If if those who disagree with Geert uh, feel strongly that he's wrong, uh, it's important and Geert wants them to explain to him why he's wrong. And <clears throat> I've just wanted to be open-minded uh, to uh, consider that Geert could be right and he first made he first expressed these concerns over a year ago and uh i've been following his writings and and he has a website where he has posted a lot of his interviews and i have found them to be very uh, illuminating i've learned a lot of immunology and vaccinology and virology from geert uh, <clears throat> and a lot of his predictions and his concerns uh, have have played out uh, so far. And so uh, it's not as if the things he's concerned about have not turned out to happen. Um, and just very quickly, his current concern, well, his first concern was that this mass vaccination program was going to be responsible for uh, putting so much immune pressure on the virus and so much immune uh, and so much viral pressure back on the immune system uh, that uh, a succession of uh, predominant new variants would develop that would each of which would be increasingly more infectious, increasingly more vaccine resistant. And Geert's biggest concern is that inevitably, eventually, uh, this situation would uh, drive the development of a more virulent var variant. And then we would end up with a variant that was very infectious and very virulent at the same time, and that was resistant to vaccines. Mm -hmm. And then we would be in deep trouble. So, so I wanted to ask a question about that, because yes, it, once you align yourself to Gert, though, you do realize that people are going to box your thinking in to almost a, um, a fringe element of, of thought. How do you feel about that? Because you would have recognized this before. Well, um, I'm aligning myself with the concept that we need to have healthy dialogue about about complex, difficult uh, issues. And I'm sure Gilt, Geert feels the same way. And I'm not afraid of, of being criticized. Uh, my, my concern is to try to demystify uh, the whole COVID situation as much as possible, try to understand it as accurately and honestly as we can. And so that's what I'm committed to. Um, and so I'm not, I'm not advocating necessarily that people need to accept Geert's position as the gospel truth. I'm just advocating that people be open-minded and engage in constructive, healthy uh, dialogue about these very complex issues. We live in a very polarized society now. Uh, <clears throat> uh, people are very frustrated. They're very confused. They're very angry. They've gone to extremes one way or the other. And there uh, has not been constructive kinds of dialogue. Instead, we've had destructive kinds of uh, comments being made. So. Uh, more than anything else, I'm an advocate for being open-minded and for engaging in healthy uh, scientific dialogue about these very complex issues. As, as we come towards the end, Rob, yeah. and we are just doing an overview of, of everything, I wanted to 
ask you to share some thoughts about your final section here, which is about the informed consent and the yeah. obligations for pediatricians with regards to this. Well, let me, let me say that as a pediatrician, I have uh, always felt that patient education is extremely important. And I've also uh, been very impressed with uh, the capacity of parents to uh, comprehend even very complex medical information. And I've been impressed with how therapeutic it can be to demystify situations and put an emphasis on patient education and how much uh, parents benefit from that education. So I feel very strongly in the whole tradition of pediatrics is to emphasize uh, patient education and demystification of complex medical issues. So one thing that I feel very strongly about is parents deserve to have uh, to be helped to have a, a deep and accurate understanding of what they're dealing with. Uh, <clears throat> and that's what informed consent is all about. You can't have true informed consent if uh, you haven't helped the consenter to understand, uh, have a pretty good understanding of what they're dealing with. And that's what I said earlier that um, I think uh, pediatricians have an obligation and parents have a right uh, to uh, proper uh, patient education about COVID issues, particularly COVID uh, vaccination. And we need to make sure that they have a, a true and accurate informed consent process that they're going through. And where can people read your open letter? You do have a website, don't you? Yeah, I have a, a website. Um, it's called Notes from the Social Clinic. I'll put the link up for, um, so that people can, yeah. And I've posted actually uh, the open letter and 22 other articles that I've written about COVID. And again, I wrote a lot of these articles to help myself and help my my daughters and grandkids understand all of these issues. So it's a process of educating myself. But anyway, I've shared all of those documents uh, on my website. And then uh, Dr. Vandenbosch uh, uh, wanted to post the open letter on his website so it can be found there as well. And I'll, I'll be sharing the link as well onto my Substack, and I'll, I'll, I'll allow people to, to be able to see it as well. So I've, I've put it on, on the website as something for people to read. And, you know, um, as, we, as we close out, Rob, and I really appreciate you speaking in this kind of open way in an environment that I know you don't feel very comfortable in, but it's still something that you felt strongly enough that this needs to be said. And I can't explain to people just how much of a stance that is for someone like yourself to do that. What would be your closing words to the audience? What would you like them to take away other than reading the letter if they can't read it, what would be the most important takeaway point? Well, maybe my final comment would be that I hope that this open letter might help bring people together. Uh, I, I hope it might facilitate uh, <clears throat> bringing people in from the extremes um, into the center uh, to engage in constructive dialogue, uh, both at the scientist and physician level, but also with uh, regarding citizens and, and uh, politicians. And also, I think a lot of families uh, have, have been broken apart over issues of COVID and COVID vaccination. There have been a lot of rifts within families and within friends and even within physician colleagues, I can say. And 
one of my hopes is that this uh, open letter will provide substance that will help uh, heal those wrists, wrists, wrists by providing a, a deeper understanding of of a lot of the issues involved with COVID. That, that's tremendous, Rob. Really, really appreciative. And I just wanted to say to everyone here, thank you very much for joining us. It's been a tremendous honor to listen to Rob, to read through some of his work. I'd encourage everyone to take a look at it. It is a lot of information, so you don't have to try and rush and read it all at the same time. But certainly take a look at it, share it with family and friends, reflect on it, and just remember at the end of the day, science is about discussion, debate, and finding the answer in the midst of the confusion. And I think that's what we have to do for COVID-19. So I'll ask you to hang on with me, Rob, as I say thank you to everyone who has watched us and look out for more presentations in the near future. Have a great day to everyone. Thank you, Philip. You're